should be live here. There we are. Oh. What? I I can see some camera information. Uh, we have an ad. Okay. <clears throat> Someone saw you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's let people have a second to come on. There you are. Sorry about that, guys. I accidentally left the uh, the camera information stuff on the screen. <laughs> There's a bit of a delay. There is. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right, mic volume is low. Let me see if I can help that. How's that? Sounds good to me, David. Thank you. Everybody else good? Thanks, John. Yes, he says to remember to hit the thumbs up and subscribe <laughs> and ring the bell if you haven't already. <laughs> Love that. Someone sticks around to the end. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, all right, I apologize in advance. If I'm in one ear and Christy's in the other, I don't really know what causes that. So I'll, I'll try and fix that. But at least the video is looking way better today than it has. It does look way better. Yeah. Weird. He's left. She's right. Well, she is seated to my right. So it shouldn't be too weird. All right, guys. <laughs> anyway, how about we start the stream? So uh, how's everyone doing today? Good. I see there's a bunch of questions already racked up here so where's christy christy is off camera as i always am sorry <laughs> sorry if you were thinking you were gonna see me uh will there be a video i'm gonna start with thomas here because it just right in front of me will there be a video about the new yamaha avantage receivers yes one is coming uh we have the a8a which I'm not looking forward to saying in the script multiple times in an episode, but we do have it. We are currently putting it through its paces and there is a lot to go over with that particular uh, piece, but it is coming. So. And if you're wondering why I'm not on camera, if you're new here, just because I choose not to be, it's just a personal choice I've made. I feel more comfortable off camera. I think that, Look, that's just what I want to do. So I appreciate those of you who respect my wishes and don't push me to do something that I'm not comfortable with. For everyone else, I'm sorry if you're disappointed. I get it. It's probably a little weird, but let's just roll with it and have a good time. Okay, moving on. Moving on. Got that out of the way. Um, hey, Mr. Tadashi, I will not get over it, okay? I tried to answer your question, you know, so in case you're new and you, you weren't really, for you know, weren't really sure why. I'm not on camera, but you can take that attitude somewhere else. Cool? All right. So. <laughs> uh, I'm going to answer CW Siggy 77 He has, he asked thoughts on Rocky Mountain Audio Fest being permanently canceled. Um, yeah, I think that that's, that is really sad. I thought Rocky Mountain was a pretty decent audio show, to be honest. And I wish that every trade show uh, was able to stick around. But I also think that, you know, we're witnessing a sea change, not only in hi-fi, but also just in how people conduct business and the things that we thought we needed once upon a time in order to reach the masses. We just don't really need anymore. And because of uh, what we've all been through for the last 18 months, I think manufacturers in a lot of ways um, have shifted in terms of like how they want to reach audiences. And unfortunately, one of the, the byproducts of, or the, the things that kind of went away because of that were trade shows. 
<laughs> uh, let's see here. Hope that answered your question. Ohm Walsh 2, Ohm Walsh 2, Ohm Walsh 2. Ohm Walsh 2. Um, there are no current plans to review the Ohm Walsh 2 or any of the Ohm speakers. It's been probably, I don't know, 15 years or so since I've, I've heard an Ohm product. It, nothing against them. Nothing against them. Um, I can look into it or I can ask Christy to look into it. I just, I've never walked into a dealer and seen an ohm speaker i've only really seen them at trade shows so i try not to talk about things that aren't some in some way shape or form like readily available now if that has changed my apologies and i will look into it but they're not on my radar because they just i don't know of their more readily available appeal sorry i'm Today's been quite a day. We almost lost our dog. Yes. Uh, earlier, about may, maybe about an hour before we went live. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about Andrew, but me personally, I'm feeling a little bit frazzled. Uh, so please, please bear with us um, as we sort of get ourselves or regain our composure. It's, it's. I we literally ran a mile around the uh, the house chasing her down. Um, I'm just thankful we got her back, but I, I am feeling kind of crazy right now. <laughs> Is someone giving you a hard I'm like, time? I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm I'm gonna get I'm I'm gonna catch up soon. I promise. Okay. Uh, thank you. Someone just gave us a super chat, and uh, thank you, Trinsic Official, uh, tech deprived in Australia. Could you please test the Belkin Soundform Connect AirPlay Two adapter? Hmm. Um, you know, to be honest with you, I didn't even know that product existed and I am actually looking for AirPlay 2 adapters. So, um, I'm going to take a note of that one. I can't promise that I'm going to review it, but thanks for the tip because <laughs> I have some vintage stuff that I'm looking to adapt to AirPlay. So maybe that's what I'm looking for. Uh, thank you. Um, oh boy. Let's Did you talk about MagnaPan already. I have not. I have not talked about MagnaPan. Seriously, I'm, I'm, my brain is not functioning. Did someone have a question about someone, MagnaPan? Someone, Video Pro Boston says, still no MagnaPan speakers review in the works. No, sorry. We, 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 don't, we don't have, I, I, I personally haven't reached out to them. I, I know the people at MagnaPan. Um, I know the owners and we go way, I go way back with them. I have reviewed and owned, by the way, MMGs, MMG12s, or sorry, not MMG12s, MG12s, uh, 1.6s, and 3.6s. So I'm very familiar with MagnaPan. Um, not to say that there won't be a MagnaPan review in the future. There very well could be. However, the way with which I tend to like to talk about MagnaPan has not always been in line with the way that they would prefer that I talk about MagnaPan. And I like to play Mag I like to play all types of music through their speakers, including Nirvana. And in my 3.6 review, which is now probably getting on to 10 years old, um, I demoed it using Nirvana's Nevermind pretty heavily. And they weren't really happy with me for doing that. Um, there's just some brands that really like to hang on to, I guess, call it a classic uh, audiophile sort of mentality with respect to the type of music that's going to be listened to through their products. And I thought it was really great to let other people know that just because this is a, a brand that's been around for a while and, and has that audiophile credit, that you could listen to more modern music. You could listen to rock music. You could rock out. And um, so I stuck by my review. I really like that review. If you Google MagnaPan 3.6 in my name, you'll probably find it. Um, but yeah, ever since then, they kind of don't return my calls. <laughs> I, it, you don't think that they would? You don't think anything? You know, honestly, they probably would at this point. I, I could probably reach out. I think enough time has passed. And obviously, we're doing something a little bit different here. And maybe they're into something different. But back in the print days, um, yeah, it was a... Uh, hmm. <laughs> well, somebody very early on, before we even went live, was asking about 
the Sony A9 versus the JBL9 um, mm-hmm. bar and sound system. I, I apologize. I've tried to find your original question, and it is it's lost in the ether. Um, but I did want to make sure we address that because they showed up early. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know their name, but the the question was something about the compare a comp- basically wanting a comparison between those two systems. So. I mean, okay, I, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, we didn't remember your screen name. Um, I would say for me, there isn't a comparison. I really did not enjoy my time with the JBL Bar 9. And I understand that to each their own, and everyone is bound to have a slightly different experience when it comes to some of these higher tech products, especially those that rely on wireless technology and signals. But the JBL bar for me would not stay connected to its surrounds and had mad EARC issues um, or ARC issues. And so it really made the experience with that particular product very, very difficult to enjoy. And now there were instances where when it worked that I found the sound to be rather good. It's just it would never work for an entire film. Now. I know a lot of you have the JBL bar and you're very happy with it. <laughs> Christy, I apologize if you guys are getting a bunch of thumping oh, and feedback. I'm sorry. Someone said they couldn't, that my, my volume needed to be turned up. So I, I was... turn it up over here. Okay. Well, um, anyway, I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> so I just don't recommend the, um, I just don't recommend the JBL bar nine from me personally. I think the, the Sony HT a nine is just leaps and bounds better so long as you get the subwoofer if we can take just a brief aside some of you have since purchased the ht a9 for yourself probably based on our review and that's awesome and some of you have written in and said that you have found the performance to be somewhat underwhelming but have admitted that you have not purchased one of the matching subwoofers i it was very clear in my review that if the subwoofer is not optional, I know it doesn't come as standard with the HT A9, but you have to budget for a sub and you have to budget for the SW5. I do not recommend the A9 system with the SW3. You have to get the 5. That's the one that was designed and made for that particular system. The, the, the SW3 really is kind of a carryover from some older Sony stuff, whereas the the other one is better. And if you don't get the sub, I am not surprised if some of you are underwhelmed. And if you do get the sub, you need to place the sub following proper subwoofer placement because the spatial audio mapping and all of that really doesn't tackle the sub. It tackles the four speakers. Yes, it includes the sub, but it doesn't it doesn't you can't put like the sub in a completely different room and then have it mapped to where you are. You have to follow the rules of proper subwoofer replacement, which I believe I said in the review. So if you get the A9, remember it needs the sub. And if you're curious what I think the A9 is better than the JBL9, full stop. <laughs> okay, uh, Brian Thornton would, would like to know if you've reviewed any audio engine products, specifically their bookshelf speaker line. They, um, I guess he recently purchased the A5. Okay. And he's happy with it. So. Okay, yeah. Um, I haven't reviewed any audio engine, but I have heard their product, and I'm not surprised that you find them to be very good because I think they're very good. Um, I don't... These trucks in this neighborhood, guys, when we're live, I can't edit it out. Um, we, haven't, we haven't reviewed any, but I am familiar with it, and I'm totally not surprised that you're happy with your purchase. Uh, we have some questions about SVS. Oh, okay. Uh, the, their speakers, the Ultra Towers, mm-hmm. um, uh, H2O FSU. Hello from Florida, <laughs> uh, or hello in Florida, I should say. And I, they say, Andrew, I came across an old written review of yours mm-hmm. for SVS Ultra Towers. Just wondering if you remember those and if there's a power amp you would recommend to drive them. Um, and then someone else asked about the SVS bookshelves, but I've I've done lost that comment. So. Okay. Oh wait, Ultra Center. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. So just talk SVS for a minute and then I'll figure out what the next <laughs> question can be. All right. Um, obviously, I'm a huge fan of SVS subwoofers. And yes, I did review the Ultra Towers when they first came out. And I think shortly thereafter, I was sent a pair of bookshelves, but I'm not sure if I ever reviewed them or not. Anyway, they are phenomenal, dynamic, punchy speakers. They really are. I know in my print review, um, you know, the, the treble for me could be a little bit forward if memory serves. And I wasn't the biggest fan of that high, high gloss piano finish that they had. But at that time, they were just, they were great value for money. I'm pretty sure I ran those though on Crown Amps. Um, I probably also ran those on Parasound products because I'm just going back in my mind through what systems I had at that time because that was all the way back when I lived in California. So I probably had Parasound. I knew, I, I know I have out, I had Outlaw, Crown, Parasound, and Onkyo Integra. And those would have been the products that I would have used on those particular speakers. And I think the Parasounds might have been just a tad too much or a tad too forward. Uh, Outlaw was fine or great. Crown obviously was fantastic. Um, and the Onkyo Integra, well, the Integra would have been a processor combined with the Crown amps or the Parasound amps. And the Onkyo would have been one of their receivers, probably the RZ50 equivalent of its day. And so I probably would steer you towards something that is of 2021, but from those family of brands. Um, you could probably try Audiolab would be another one that would probably work very well with SVS. Um, Audiolab is, it works with everything. It, it literally is the don't suck it, don't suck, you know. The unsuck button, yeah. Of 2021. It, it kind of is. It, it, it is just, it works with everything. I've yet to ha hear any speaker on it that that didn't sound great connected to it. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> keeping with SVS, Gareth Newbold was mm -hmm. wondering, is it worth getting a second subwoofer? He currently has a single SVS SB1000. Is it worth it getting a second subwoofer? One of the things about when people start buying multiple subwoofers, I think one of the um, myths about subwoofers is that if you have two, you're doubling the amount of bass that you're going to have. And that simply isn't true. Um, a second subwoofer is only going to add uh, about three to maybe six dB of bass over what a, what a single subwoofer add, adds. And if properly set up, it really shouldn't add much at all. What a second subwoofer is going to do is potentially, if set up correctly, is going to spread the bass that one sub does, it's going to spread it around more evenly over a wider area. And that's why, you know, if you have a system with four subwoofers or five subwoofers or however many you have, um, when people are like, man, I just need to get a bigger one or a more powerful one because it's not like getting any louder. That's not what multiple subwoofers are for. It's really about spreading even good tight base around the widest possible area. So to your question, if you have a single subwoofer and you find that there are places in your room where when you sit down, it just doesn't feel like you are experiencing the same bass in that area opposed to where you sit somewhere else in your room. Now, two things are happening. You could be sitting in a null where bass frequencies are being sucked out of your room. But it's also that that part of the room needs bass reinforcement, in which case you would be a candidate for a second subwoofer. But if, say, you're just looking for even bass across your couch and you sit on one end, sit in the middle, and sit on the other end, you don't really notice a change in bass, you probably don't need a second subwoofer. Uh, I just want to do a couple of shout-outs to people who have done super sh super chats. Mm. Uh, let's see. Sean Vidal, I am looking for your, your, your question. <laughs> I promise I will get to it. Um, I want to say thank you to Mike... Bar Barker, I think it is. I, you just, oh God, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Um, there, where's the other? Scott Woodford. He says he has a Morant CD 6007 and he loves it. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for contributing to the episode today. We really appreciate it. Um, I swear, Sean, I will, I will, I will look for your your question and and and, and I will happily interrupt Andrew when I find it. Um, really quick, Jody Burns. 
big time contributing 20 bucks. Thank you so much. He says he or she, mm -hmm. Jody, I have the Yamo S803. Mm. I love the sound. They produce for, you know, an affordable amount of money. I'm looking to move up in quality with a similar engaging sound signature. What would you recommend? You want to move up from the Yamos with an engaging sim similar sound signature. Well, you could easily move up to the concert series um, from Yamo, which is the line above the S series that you have. And obviously you're going to get a slightly more refined sound, but it's still going to be in the same vein. And I understand that I think Amazon and Crutchfield actually have a shipment of those and they are relatively in, I think they are in stock and they're currently on sale. Um, that would be the, the next, if you want to, if you like the Yamo sound and the S series has been good to you, but you want a little bit more, maybe a touch more refinement, that would be a great way to go without breaking the bank. Other, uh, alternatives without breaking the bank, obviously, uh, monitor audio is going to get you somewhere in that same vein. Uh, the monitor audio bronze series. We are, yeah, bronze, bronze 100s is what we use. Um, we have the bronze 100s, yeah, the 50s. I mean, to me, I think the Yam, the Yamo and monitor audio would be a pretty similar sound. A little uh, bit. I the, Yeah, a little the, bit. But the monitors are going to be a little bit punchier, I think. Well, they have that aluminum spun driver, which I think does give a little bit more uh, forwardness in bass. Um, I know the Yamos tend to be a little bit more forward in the tweeter, but the the monitor audios, at least in the bronze series, they kind of add that bit of impact in the bass as well. So that'd be something to look look to. Did you mention the Hecos? I would look at Hecko. Hecko. Yeah, Hecko would be another great one. The seven um, hundreds we just reviewed. If you want to go with the tower, I think they I think the Aurora comes in. A, in I think it's called the three hundred as a bookshelf. I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what whether you're looking to step to stay with a, a stand mount or or go tower, but that would be another mm -hmm. uh, route you could go. But those are some good options to, to, yeah, to take a look at. Absolutely. All right, Sean, I got you. <laughs> All right. I got you, brother. What's this question? Okay. I'm looking for a 5.1.4 Atmos receiver. I like Yamaha, but would consider other brands. Also, do you ever use Rush for demo music? Try Mystic, Mystic Rhythms. We I, don't really use Rush that I think often. I'm sorry if you can hear sirens. Um, <laughs> I think we've used Rush in the back. I think we've used or listened to Rush once or twice, but not like it's not on the demo demo list. In terms of 5.1.2 or 4? 4. Four. Is the Onkyo 5100? No, but the 7100 I think will do it. There's a 6100 and a 7100 61 from, and, from Onkyo that you yeah I don't know the specs off the top of my head but I would look I would look into either of those look into those look into that or the um, of course you have the Integra as well as the Pioneer Elite equivalent um, they're all going to be around I think around that eight to nine hundred dollar price point for the five dot one dot four capability. Um, didn't the Denon we just review? Uh, I think the Denon we just reviewed will will do that as as well. Um, but I, I I really would I would probably look to the Onkyo, and I know we haven't reviewed it. The uh, the seventy one hundred. Double check me on the specs on that uh, on Google. But I think that one also has Dirac, and it's like nine ninety nine. And if that's the case, that's going to be a hell of a thing. Kelly Nelson, thank you so much. Um, Kelly says, I love what Christy brings to the table. Oh, it just disappeared. Oh, it was no. a very nice comment. I was trying to read it. But hey, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and Brian, yes, the dog is safe. Thank God. Although I kind of wanted to murder her once we got a, got a hold of her. Yeah. <laughs> she gave me a heart attack. Um, um, oh, Kelly, you're saying the 7100 is nine channels. So is that is that because you can do 5.1.4? Or, you know, configuration. That's that's the thing about some of these like seven, nine, eleven channel amplifiers is you you kind of have to like download the manual and really see uh, what type of breakdown of channels because a nine nine dot one channel receiver in theory can do nine dot one dot or I'm sorry, five dot one dot four, because that's nine channels. Um, but sometimes they don't let you. So whenever you're shopping for an AV receiver, 
uh, go to the product page on whatever product it is, download the manual, and then you'll find a chapter on, on breakdown of channels. And that will tell you what it can do. Because some of these, believe it or not, even at 11 channels, they limit you to only like two Atmos channels, which are typically in the front. Um, so that's, that's all the advice I can give you without physically having the device in my hands and having tried it. And you guys need to know that when we review AV receivers, um, and they, they turn out to be 11 channels or, or however many channels, um, we typically, we typically test 5.1 or 2.2 because our room really does become overwhelmed when we start adding more channels than that. So just because something may have 11 or 12 or 15 channels, oh, excuse me, my phone, we, uh, we don't always, uh, are, we're not able to extrapolate a system to test that. I will put a speaker to each speaker terminal to make sure they all work, but we have never. Did you guys hear that? Oh my gosh, this neighborhood. This neighborhood is insane. Hence, hashtag trying to move. <laughs> um, no, we still haven't found a place. Still haven't found a the place. The market is insane. No one can afford a house. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to do. And I, I have seriously have real estate fatigue where I don't even know what I want anymore, if I like anything anymore. And I'm. it just makes me sad. Anyway. Oh my gosh, these con the comments move so quickly, it's really hard to keep up. I think you're going to have to slow them down even more next time. <laughs> um, loved your magnet review. Any plans to review those smaller towers or bookshelves? We are working on getting more magnet reviews for you guys. Yes. So I we don't have anything currently scheduled, but we're requesting stuff. Yeah, um, that was our first uh, foray into magnet and hugely impressed so obviously we're trying to see if uh the the sound quality carries over into their other lines and so we hope to bring you those as soon as possible move to lubbock <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> uh, uh, it's normally guys it's it look this neighborhood is someone said you live in the hood i don't know if we do or not we um, do not live no. i mean i don't everyone's definition is different i don't no. think we do um, this neighborhood's not usually that loud, but today, I don't know if it's the wind around here or the fact that the temperature is cooling down and so everyone's just feeling themselves, but today was an especially loud day. <laughs> uh, Jared Tomlinson asked, do you have to send back all the gear you re review or do you get to keep it? Uh, some Sometimes we, we get to hold on to things. Well, okay. If we request it. Yes. They're, afterwards. Yes. Everything that we ask for that we don't purchase on our own, for example, like the Bose or whatever, the Bose sound bars, um, everything that we request, we request knowing that we have a limited window with it because we usually have to sign like a loaner agreement and that it is going back. At the end of the review, if we think that it has a benefit to you guys in terms of, for example, the Onkyo RZ50, like there is more to talk about with relation to home theater, um, Dirac and other speakers where we feel like this is going to be something that is going to benefit not only you guys, but our ability to do other things. When the review is over, we may ask if we can hang on to it for a longer period of time, in which case we'll kind of negotiate a new loan period and then we'll get to hang on to it, you know? But sometimes we'll ask and they'll be like, mm, I only have like two of these in the pipeline and other reviewers need it, in which case it goes back in the box and we have to send it back. Now, there have been some things that we have said that we like on this channel and we recommend or even urge you guys to go seek out for yourselves, give them a listen, decide for yourself if you like them. But we ultimately haven't kept them purely because we are running out of space. Um, the 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 desire to want to hang on to things that are truly good, even purchase them outright, is very, very high. But I am kind of very, um, I don't know what the word is. I, I guess I'm just, I'm not, it's not stingy, but I'm just very aware of the amount of stuff coming in versus what we physically have room to store. And so a lot of times I will let something go that I'm absolutely passionate about and love, uh, purely because I just don't have the physical square footage to hang on to it. 
I kind of want to hang on, hang on to everything. She does. Oh I, my god, I get she attached does. to stuff, and I, <laughs> I don't know. I I almost feel like I'm an audio hoarder, and I worry that we we're gonna need it. And I don't, you know, or I really really like something like the magnet speakers that we just reviewed. We did ship them back because they're huge and they just take up way way too much room. And we had a really, we had a really consider what else we have in house and if the magnet speakers are truly different than other things we already have that also take up less space because that's something that we think about like we have enough high high efficiency speakers so we we could really use something that's a little bit harder um to drive something a little bit more traditional Mm -hmm. but which we which we thought we would get with the Bowers and Wilkins, um, which turned out to be a complete disaster. Mm. But yeah, so we have to really think about like what's going to be best for the channel and yeah. in terms of other products that may come be coming in the pipeline to review versus what we really, really love and want to keep. Yeah, it's it gets it gets hard. Yeah, it's not ugh, it's not the easiest thing in the world because I we do get attached. In fact, there's a there's a pair of speakers that are currently in house. You guys haven't seen yet, but uh, I might just say they got lost in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> um, Goran, you ask, does soundproofing work? Is it necessary for everyday listening? Um, I'm going to interpret this question two ways, and I hope you don't mind. One, I'm interpreting it as soundproofing, like you are trying to keep sound from leaking out into other spaces. If done properly, it absolutely does work. The problem is, is most people don't take it to the extreme that you need to in order to truly isolate your room so that sound does not leak out. And typically what you have to do is you kind of have to do what recording studios do, and that is build a room within a room and use, you know, kind of double double gap doors and the whole bit. But if you're just referring to room treatments, like do room treatments work in term? And the answer to that question is yes, they do. Room treatments can and do work. Now, two things about room treatments. I think a lot of people buy the wrong room treatments. I think they buy or get room treatments based on what they see other rooms having. And they go and they do that and they even put them up in their room in places that they have visually seen other people do it. And that may not be the best thing for you. And so that's why when I work with room treatments or when I urge other people to work with room treatments, I always say that you should reach out to the people at GIK Acoustics. This is not sponsored in any way, shape or form. They do not know that I continue to advocate for this service. But the reason I do it is because I was I was one of their customers and I used their service. And this is what really opened my eyes to room treatments because I, like many of you, probably looked at room treatments and said, you know what I need? I need a couple of panels on my first order reflections. Then I need a couple of panels directly behind my speakers and then I'm going to be good. When in reality, when I shared the dimensions of my room, when I shared my listening tastes and all of that, we discovered that I didn't need those types of panels at all at all and i actually ended up needing a lot fewer room treatments than what i initially thought i needed based on what everyone in forums and whatnot were telling me so i would highly encourage you if you are shopping for room treatments go to gikacoustics.com i think it is or just google that fill out their little online form and they will walk you through and they're really it's really quite accurate what they're able to do And you might be surprised. You might be surprised that you end up with a different type of package than what you thought you needed. Now, second thing about that, do you need those things? I don't know. It really does depend on what level of perfection you want to go chase. If you're very happy with the way your room is sans treatments right now, then I'm going to say that you don't. But that's up to you. So, Rob Rob Wiley has a question. Did you prefer the Sonos Faber... Uh, Lumina 2s or the Kev LS50 Metas most with the name Unity Atom? I'm going to say that I ultimately kind of prefer the Sonos Faber Lumina 2s on everything. Um, I understand they are a little bit more forward, a lot less neutral of a speaker. 
than the uh, metas. metas, but I don't know. That is a speaker that every time I bring it out, every because we have it, it's those are ours. Every time I bring them out and I plug them in, even if it's been a couple of weeks, they always kind of sound to me like the first time that I'm hearing them. And they have that kind of wow factor. I understand they're not perfect. I understand that they are maybe an acquired taste even, but they do it for me. And I was, the Metas are one of those types of loudspeakers. And I kind of have this same feeling with Harman products in that I appreciate what they are doing to no end. I, I, I can't argue that they are bad or that you're not going to like them but I can argue that if you're, they're not your favorite, I get it. Does that make sense? Um, it's just one of those things like Harman products and, and Kef products. It's like, I can appreciate them. I even think they sound good to great and they amaze on a lot of levels, but I'm also not surprised when something like Illumina 2 comes in and I'm like, Ooh, I like this a little bit more despite knowing just by listening to it that I'm like, this is so clearly not a perfect speaker in comparison to say the meta or a, a revel or something like that and yet i'm like hmm, i'd rather have that i really love the lumina twos as mm -hmm. well i thought i really really liked the the metas though um i would have to listen to them side by side to be able to really say whether or not i would which one i would choose because i'm pretty sure we didn't have the metas in-house when we reviewed the lumina twos so you're really having to go, a lot of times we have to go off of auditory memory, which is crap. Very short. <laughs> um, but I agree with Andrew. Every time he pulls them out and they're in our system, it's amazing. And they're beautiful. They don't take up a lot of space. They're, they're really phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But the problem is you can't really get them anywhere unless you go to a dealer. And I've we've even heard stories where people have gone in and the dealer... I think this was a dealer in Houston decided they only had one speaker, I guess, or one pair. And so they wouldn't unbox them for the uh, customers. So that makes things hard to, to buy and demo if the, you know, people won't open it, but yeah. it's anyway. really hard to hear a speaker in the box. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Audio, audio brands, uh, perfecting sales prevention in 2021, yeah. you know, I, I, it's, it's fantastic. Oh man. Um, Okay, A K D O M U N, super chat. Thank uh -huh. you so much. He has a set of Omega Super Three XRS, which I don't even know what that is. Okay, and hit me would with like it. Would like to know which amp. All right. Do if you know what he's talking about? I do. Oh. It's just been a minute. <laughs> um, if memory serves, your speaker is fairly high efficiency or can be driven by lower watt amplifiers because if I'm remembering correctly back in my early deckware purchasing days Omega was a speaker brand that before deckware made speakers that they were recommending pairing with their amplifiers if that's the case I don't know what your budget is maybe take a look at the deckware Tori or one of their integrated amplifiers I think you might be pleasantly surprised if you want something that is solid state class AB, you're probably gonna be probably be fine with a class AB around 30 to 40 watts, in which case um, a pretty smitten kitten, although the review's not out yet, but I'll let you in on a little secret. The Audio Lab M1 um, is kind of an all-inclusive little name unity atom-like device. That sounds really good with a lot of stuff. Maybe give that a shot. Yeah, seriously, Audio Lab doesn't make anything so far bad. So far, so far. Anyway, um, mm -hmm. Mohammed Ahmed, ten twenty three. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for your super chat. Uh, greetings from Toronto. He or she says, YouTuber friend of yours made a video list listing the reasons <laughs> why bookshelves are better than towers, especially if you're using a subwoofer for flexibility and space saving. Would love your thoughts. Mm. Yeah, uh, the YouTuber you're referring to is Randy, the cheap audio man. I don't know if he's in here today, but uh, hi, Randy. Yeah, Randy ripped us off. We actually did that video before him. Shots fired. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. 
Um, yeah, I saw that video and I thought Randy made some really good points. Um, we made similar points in our video, but it's not because I think Randy copied us. There's all, there, those are the points to be made for why bookshelves and towers are better. I advocate for bookshelves over towers with a lot of people um, because, because A, they tend to be a little bit more affordable. They take up a little bit less visual space. And all of you guys can at me down in the comments about, well, when you add stands, they become the same. Fine, fine, fine. Um, that notwithstanding. <laughs> um, the thing about loudspeakers is sometimes the place where mid-range and tweeters or mid-range and high frequency sounds best in your room is not the same place that bass is going to sound best in your room. And so being able to detach the bass, i.e. put it in a subwoofer and move it where it sounds best gives you absolute flexibility to make sure that your system always sounds as it should. And this is something that I discovered when I used to have Def Tech towers, definitive technology towers with like built-in subwoofers in the base. I always had a really difficult time because obviously you can't disconnect the subwoofer from the rest of the speaker. So you better hope that where you put that speaker, bass sounds really good. Otherwise, you're just going to take that volume and lower it all the way down so that the sub doesn't overpower the mid-range and the tweeter. And in fact, I ultimately, with some of those speakers, ended up having to get a second or separate subwoofer so that I could just not use the sub in my towers and use a third-party sub that was able to be placed where it sounded best. And that kind of really kicked off my love affair of bookshelf speakers because I like to have flexibility. Gondolier 41413, any plans to review triangle bookshelf speakers? Sorry, we don't have any any upcoming plans for triangle. No. No. So um, moving on, Mark Wash, I hear the Sony HTA9s are out of stock until February. I hope that isn't so. I don't have any insight to that. Yeah. What I will say, though, about things being in stock or out of stock, one thing you guys need to know, <laughs> there's a real shortage out here. Like, we can't even get stuff in for review because people, brands, when I say people, I mean like the brands, they don't have anything to send. Yeah. They don't have anything to send. The retailers don't have the product. Brands are announcing something brand new. The retailer doesn't have stock. They don't even know when they're getting stock. Stuff sitting on a boat. Can't get it unloaded. It is a real problem. So yeah. if you have something on your mind that you want to buy and you see it available, get it. Yeah, I would like get it. Like this idea that you can wait for it to go on sale or which I, which I get. I totally get. And you, you may be a lucky person. And, you know, circle back around and, and it'll be on sale and good for you. But the likelihood is you're going to come back around and that thing that you wanted and waited for isn't going to be there. So just giving you some advice because we talked to a lot of people from mm -hmm. retailers to the manufacturers and the supply shortage is a serious problem right now. The other thing I know people are a little bit upset about and... We've, we hear it all the time in the comments, this year especially, they're upset about the how prices have increased. Yeah. And again, it's supply and demand. There is a shortage, so prices gonna, are going to go up. And then there's a really big issue with shipping fees have increased. And now you can choose to believe believe us or believe the, the people that, that mm -hmm. you know, give us this information if, if you want. But from what we're hearing, the... The manufacturers are are seeing the shipping increases significantly on their end. And oh, apologize, guys. <laughs> yeah, Andrew's over here, you know, eyeing me to to not touch the the mic stand, and and then he look what he did. Um, <laughs> but you, I know you want to chime in with the shipping container. Oh, I'll just tell you guys straight up. I mean, the cost of bringing in goods on a shipping container used to be about five to eight grand, and in twenty twenty one, they're now. 18 to 26 thousand dollars to bring in that same container and for the probably the first half first half of this year a lot of manufacturers really tried to eat that cost for you guys but there's only so much of that they can eat because uh, that's a 5x increase in what was a very stable line item in their budget for so long and the reason for that is a lot of this stuff's just sitting because we can't get it off boats or we can't get it on trucks and there's just a backlog except everyone's demand everyone's desire and need for all of this stuff hasn't diminished and so 
yeah, I think it's, I get the frustration over price increases. Who, who wants to pay more for something? Human nature. Um, but it's not a conspiracy against you guys. It really isn't. It's just, I think we need to be prepared for things to be this much money because I think a lot of, I don't know how to, I don't want to say that we've had it too good for too long. I'm just, I think that things have not been appropriately priced in an effort to get more things into the market and have created a flood of options. But now, much like just before the housing crash, when like everyone who could install a doorbell or a security system suddenly became a home theater installation expert. When the housing crash happened, the real companies that knew how to do that service, home theater installation, they survived. And other people, their businesses went back to whatever they were. Um, I think you're seeing a market correction. Um, but supply and demand being what it is, it's still going to remain high for the foreseeable future because we cannot get the shortages solved at the drop of a hat. Christoph said, just wanted to say thanks for introducing me to this hobby. I'm definitely a beginner, but your review of the C6 turntable actually got me to upgrade my cheap one and it's been awesome. Oh, thank you, A, for that very nice comment and for not, um, for not judging the C6 and giving it a shot and finding that it worked for you. It's actually a pretty decent turntable. It is. Craig Lang says, with your penchant for minimal design, how do you cope with speakers being a foot or more away from the wall? Um, That's a good question. It is. I guess part of it is I'm just used to speakers needing to be out away from the wall. I've been doing this for 20 years, and so that that's just something that's normal to me now. Um, I would say that everything in interior design is about balance. And so if you can visually balance things out and make them make sense, you don't really notice the, the difference in distance, really. And so everything that I try and do, we're always trying to kind of create triangles of interests. And speakers create a really great triangle of interest, not only usually with a display or a rack that sits between them, but then a reverse triangle of interest between yourselves between where you sit in your listening position and the speakers themselves. And so even with the speakers far out from a wall or close to a wall, it's easy to create visual balance with them if you don't look at the negative space in your room around the speaker and think, I've got to fill it. You know what I mean? I think a lot of times when it comes to interior design, people have a real problem with negative space. And I'm only saying this uh, with as much love in my heart, but because we're, t we're touring so many homes uh, right now, even virtually, as we look for a house, it's like, it's not clutter. It's just people, we have a tendency to see an open shelf, see an open counter, see an open corner, and, our, and as human beings, we tend to want to fill it. And if you are constantly filling negative space, then yeah, I can see how a speaker out from the wall with then stuff behind it, like plants or whatever, it kind of starts to create this congestion. But let them breathe. Let it breathe, and maybe your mind will breathe, and you'll start to get a little bit more used to it. Oh, and for the record, most people don't have any audio gear in their homes. Mm -mm. They don't. Or if they do, their setup is a mess. I mean, we have seen some... We, I know we get a lot of flack about our room mm -hmm. and our setup. And I'm just like, oh, boy, you really haven't seen anything. <laughs> like, I saw a full clip uh, home theater setup, like bookshelves stuck inside cabinets, the the tower speakers completely in the uh, up against the wall, right next with the subwoofer, subwoofer right next to it. And, oh, boy, I thought that can't sound good. But you know what? What do I know? I'm not there. Uh, John... John Shepler, Shepler, sorry, Shepler, thank you so much for the super chat contribution. What is something that you reviewed and liked, but other reviewers hated, or that you hated, but other reviewers love? I mean, do you have all day? <laughs> Look, um, I can say that one thing that I know has been pretty positively, 
positively received was the the BMW uh, 600 uh, signature series speakers. And I just, I know we both absolutely did not agree with the sentiment that seemed to be uh, hanging around those loudspeakers. Um, but I don't really, I don't really care, you know? I... I think there, this this idea that everyone has to agree in order for something to be legitimized or that everyone has to agree to like a certain type of sound is one of the bigger issues that this hobby has with itself. Um, and it's one of the bigger issues that I think creates this tier of animosity, um, not only among many of you that watch, but it just feeds into the tribalism that, let's face it, is in every facet of our lives. This hobby is about finding what works for you and what makes you happy and what makes you want to listen for longer periods of time. That is the only thing that matters. That's why I say I don't care about specs. I don't care about a brand. I don't care about how much something costs because price is relative. I can show you the most perfectly measured speaker in the world and you can say it sounds boring and prefer something else. And at the end of the day, the more anyone, myself included, the more anyone tries to convince you to look at something or go a direction or their way, odds are you're going to end up unhappy because you're listening to what they want for you and you're not listening to what you need for yourself. And so I don't mind being the opposing voice from time to time. I also don't mind when I am enthusiastic about something that other people don't like. You know, um, I didn't like the BMWs. A lot of people like them. I think the Sony HT-A9 system, when set up correctly, is fantastic. There are bound to be people that disagree with me. Um, it just comes down to what works for you. And unfortunately, as much as I would love to be able to hit a button and say, this is what you need, trust me, it's going to be perfect for you. I can't do that. I can, I can surmise what it is people want or might be looking for and try and steer in a direction. But at the end of the day, you are your own judge. And guys, I mean, the reality is there's a lot of times where we're viewing this, you know, that Andrew and I come up, come away feeling differently ourselves about mm -hmm. a product and we're in the same room listening to the same music mm -hmm. to the same product and it's just so much of it just comes down to personal preference and being okay with standing behind a decision that you like what you like or that you don't like what you like and moving on with your life yeah and this answer kind of feeds into what Brian Ruby is saying. How do I know what I like and what I hear or if I'm just lazy? I have some old, uh, old school value tower speakers I want to replace, but like an old pair of shoes, I can't find anything I'm more comfortable with. There's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And if you keep coming back to what you have going, this is, this is good enough for me, I would say that you're the enlightened one. I really would because you have found something that works for you and as sexy as new gear is um, back when I was in the height of my car craze a very good friend of mine at that time told me everyone loves a new car until the first bill comes in and then the new car becomes just like your old car and hi-fi is kind of the same way in a lot of ways um, you have to be able to watch the content that people like Christy and I create with a little bit of entertainment value. Not to say that we're giving you bad information for the sake of entertainment, but not everything that gets talked about on every channel twice a week, once a week, once a month means that you have to go and get it. And what? Yeah, and so <laughs> it's fine to tune into channels like ours and hear about magnet speakers and go, man, that sounds like fun, that sounds like, that sounds like a cool speaker and I'm glad I, I got to know about it and I got to kind of see it and get a sense maybe for what it's like. But that doesn't mean that you should immediately turn and eyeball whatever it is that you have and go, well, you ain't nothing and now I need to replace you. That's not the case. That's not how this should work. But if you're like, hey, my something of 10 or 15 years gave up the ghost, I am in the market, then use these, these videos and suggestions as guides.
Totally. Ty Williams, much love to my nine-year-old daughter's favorite reviewers. That is the most adorable thing in all the world. Um, tell her hello, or if you're listening, hello. Hello, yes. Uh, Ty would like any suggestions for a thin wall apartment, even sound bars. Um, the magnets. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, Jokes. <laughs> Well, I mean, one of the features that the last Denon receiver had that I do not recall seeing in the Onkyo that I was really impressed with was the the base limiting feature. It was in the, the Odyssey setting, so I believe it's an Odyssey-specific feature, and that's why the Onkyo didn't have it. Um, but it is a, a toggle switch that you can kind of, when you know maybe you're not inside of noise or timelines sometimes with apartments or or communal walls they try and say don't be loud after a certain time if you know you're in those times you can literally flip this switch and it does a really good job stopping bass frequencies from traveling too far now i understand that's just a receiver but you could take that receiver pair it with whatever speakers you want excuse me and maybe give your neighbors a break apart from that i would say Look for products, <laughs> look for products that have loudness controls. Because what loudness is, is it is a gentle curve or a DSP that is applied that does alter the sound of things, but it's it, it is a function or a feature that is meant to give the, the presence of more dynamics at lower volumes. And a lot of sound bars, and again, go to the product website, download the manual, do a search in the manual for loudness. A lot of sound bars have this functionality and a lot of receivers, even old ones have this functionality. Um, and that can be very helpful in enabling you to have kind of a really worthwhile presentation or experience while the volume is a little bit lower. That would be my tip. Someone wants to know if we've seen Dune. <laughs> yes. We watched Dune on the X95J in Dolby Vision using the magnets, and it is a breathtakingly beautiful film. So gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, boring. That's all I'm going to say about that. It's a little boring. <laughs> but I know there's a lot of people that really love it and think it's you know masterful storytelling. I would watch it again, maybe. Mm -hmm. to see if I just didn't quite get it the first time. But when you put aside the gorgeous costuming and the, the backdrops and yeah. the set design, oh, just magnificent. Yeah. Um, it's just oh, too much laying pavement or whatever. What is the, what's the, what's oh, that yeah, phrase? Yeah. Is that the phrase? Lay, laying pavement. Just, yeah, laying, well. That could have a different connotation. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Oh, boy. I wish I could take back. Uh, things, it's fine. It's all good. I want to answer this one from High Finest 343. What is the best monster sub you've heard? Cost and size, no option. I have two. I have two. I was fortunate enough for a brief period of time to have JL Audio Gotham's uh, the big ones in my system and that sub whole, whole, whole that if you're not careful that will literally take your house off its foundation but it's it's ungodly expensive but I didn't think that I was ever going to find something that moved air like that and then I I had the good fortune of being able to live with for a relatively long period of time I wasn't able to own it outright but I, I did have it for a spell RBH 12, 12, or was it, I think it's called the 1212. It's a very tall subwoofer, um, but it is so good. And I'm going to go out on the limb and say that it is every bit the JL Audio equal, only I think it retails for around five, maybe $5,500, as opposed to 17, 18 grand for the JL Audio that sub was magnificent, absolutely magnificent. Um, going back quite a few years now, I think probably seven or eight years since I had that sub in my system, 
but it made such an impression that I'm still talking about it today. So, Jose Garcia mm-hmm. and Jonathan Much Much. Mm-hmm. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Thank you so much for contributing with your super chats. Uh, we appreciate both of you so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, backstage Pass Texas. You should talk to a realtor in Austin. Uh, we're actually looking to move out of Texas. Yeah. Um, but thank you for the tip. Dune 2021 belongs in the cat litter box. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Well. Oh. I don't know about that. But... Oh, hey. Look who's here. Dude. Nemo. Nemo dude. Propaganda. Another fellow YouTuber. Hey, oh, dude. What's, hey, up? what's up? Hey, thank you so much yes thank you um, uh, do you think mini led will be better than oled oh goodness we have some thoughts about that <laughs> well i want to believe in mini oled i do uh or not i'm sorry mini oled oh my god mini led i want to believe in mini led and i've seen really good examples of mini led granted they've been smaller um but i've seen some absolutely horrid examples of mini led and we are probably going to have a video about that very soon um mini led in this house has not been going well (laughs) but we're still figuring some things out so i i just i want to reserve judgment but let's let's just say if third time ain't the charm you're going to have a video unlike anything you've ever seen (laughs) Um, but right now, OLED, I'm just, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say OLED is still, is still the king, but thank you, Nemo, for stopping by. Yeah. But this, uh, the Sony X9, what is it called? The 95 X95 J, J. J that's behind, uh, over Andrew's sh- shoulder, mm-hmm. this TV, it's so good. Yeah. I love this television so much. I know it's, it's just a regular old, old, or no, sorry, LED, um, in 4k, but in 85 inches, chef's kiss, man, it is fantastic that's pretty good uh, nick butler still recommend the canto yu6 or yu4s as the preferred desktop setup i mean we you you've actually you've actually you've rotated away from those um, i'm back to canto though right now but you were using um he uses a lot of different things because yeah. we get sent so many um, products but you were he was using t- t- tannoy tannoy gold, gold fives which fantastic i think for desktop use, I like I liked those better. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but you've also been using some vintage speakers. Yes, um, I was using some vintage speakers on my desktop that I don't want to talk about just yet because we finally have everything about that review sorted, and it's coming soon. Um, I loved those; they were great. I had one fail, so I had to go get another one. It's an old speaker; it's like a thirty-year-old speaker. Um, but uh, figure that out. But those were great. But I'm back now to using Canto YUs, which are the little baby, little baby ones. And we're almost ready to give away a pair of the Canto YU passives. Probably be doing that in about 15 minutes or so. But so probably maybe maybe 20. 20. Okay. But it's coming up. We didn't forget. Yeah, we haven't forgotten. I, but yes. Anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think that. Um, I, the YU6s are great. YU4s are fantastic. I've actually been very happy right now um, mixing with YUs. Uh, the, the Tannoy Gold 5s, 6s, 8s, also fantastic. I'm absolutely hands down in love with JBL's 3 Series uh, of desktop or studio powered monitors. Um, those have been a reference point of mine, gosh, maybe seven years, six years. Um, So yeah, that's what I would use, but I still would highly recommend, and I still recommend the Canto YU line over the Tuck. Sorry, Canto. Oh yeah, hands down. Better than the Tuck. Uh, Steve Baker, any thoughts on what to look for in speaker stands? A, they need to look nice. (laughs) (laughs) Um, My priorities are in order. Yeah. I don't know about yours. I, 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 I know a lot of people, I know some of you guys want us to like review um, speaker stands and I don't really know how I would review them. Um, so I'm just going to say that I am with Christy on this where it's like, for me, they have to look nice. And then if they look nice and they attract my attention to want to know more about them or consider them, 
I prefer a metal build, something really stout. I want that rigidity. I want that stable um, platform, if you will. And so that is where I would start. Um, from there, I start to care a little bit about things like cable management and whatnot. But for me, it is all about build quality, looks, and stability, which is why you really only see me use one or two types of stands, and that's the solid steel tripod stands or these new um, Canto audio stands of all things. Uh, they are super, super heavy duty. I happen to think they look nice. If you caught our Canto YUP review passive, YU passive review, you saw those. They are brand new. And I have to say, I'm pretty pleased with them. And they are relatively half the price of the um, solid steel. So for those of you shopping a little bit more on a budget, that would probably be probably be a really great stand to look at. And the cable management inside that new stand is actually superior to what you're going to get with solid steel. But you could also get the the Canto. There's a Canto makes a cheaper pair of stands. They're like ninety nine dollars or something. They're narrower. They're. I yeah. actually prefer the look of those, but yeah. I I know Andrew thinks that the cable management isn't as good as the the new ones that just came out. I'll I'll try to go back and link to both of those in the description later, um, if you want to refer to that um, for your own shopping needs, but. Both of, both of those, I think, would be a good choice. Um, Grogan92, thank mm -hmm. you so, so much for contributing. Uh, Happiness is a 32-year-old trusty Rotel 8, sorry, 840VX3. Hmm. Problem is, he hasn't a clue what it sounds like in comparison to modern gear. Ignorance is bliss? Yes. <laughs> um, if you're happy with it, and it continues to work for you, even if it's decades old. Um, I don't. I don't know. I always. This is one I struggle with. This is a question I struggle with because it's like I can easily say that newer equipment may shed light on certain things, but it may shed light on certain things that you don't necessarily want to hear, and you may go rushing back to what you had because life was better. The grass is not always greener. Um, so I'm a big proponent of if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> uh, Vadim, thank you so much. How is he wants to know how is there 500 people watching and yet barely 100 likes? That is the nature of YouTube. Wait, Again. I'm seeing t I'm seeing 253 likes. I mean, I'm only seeing 10, but that's because I'm not allowed to. I can't I can't refresh my iPad, which is what I'm using to watch, um, and also why I can't tag you like I can't at you for some reason when I'm when I'm typing my comments I, so I apologize there's I do try to reply to people but mm -hmm. I can't at you because my the iPad is dumb but anyway um, Vadim says well he wants to remind everybody to click the like and thanks yeah. thanks us for everything you guys are amazing and he loves it when we disagree on audio it <laughs> opens up an awesome perspective oh well, thank you thank you so much I agree Thank you very much for that. Um, Joe Dorenzo, have I considered reviewing? Oh, I apologize, guys. You're going to hear a dog barking and maybe a loud thud because our UPS driver is dropping off some stuff. I can see him in the window. Hi. Three, two, one. There it is. Our neighbor's dog is beyond annoying. Um, Good guard dog, though. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. But because of that, I was answering someone's question. Ah, Zoo Audio. Back to that question. Have I ever considered um, that talk? Um, Zoo Audio. I have reviewed Zoo Audio products, but I have reviewed them years ago in print. It's another situation. If you... Here's, here's just kind of a tip when it comes to things that maybe I've talked about. Google the product that you want information on and then comma my name and you'll probably find a review of it i've been writing reviews since about 1999 2000 um and so i've I, I don't even know how many written reviews are out there i i wrote for three different publications over the course of 15 or 16 years before resigning and going towards alternative media and eventually ending up here on youtube so I have reviewed Zoo products. Um, I believe it was the Omen Death is what I reviewed. 
that review is online. I know it is. Just Google Omen Death and my name. You're going to find it. That sounds ominous. It was a, it was a good speaker. It, it really was. It was a lot of fun. I remember watching... Um, Wait, uh, are you saying death? Death. D-E-F. <laughs> Like, oh, that's, I, I like me, I'm <laughs> deaf. <laughs> that's why I said it was ominous sounding. Anyway, anyway. Uh, Piero C, Piero C, thoughts on WISA? Plan to review any WISA branded speakers? I think WISA is a great platform. It is, um, it is definitely more popular in Europe and has not quite taken off here in the U.S. the way it has overseas. I hope WISA uh, gains traction here in the United States. I really do. I think it's a great platform. That being said, we have had some WISA-capable products in this house from Europe, and for whatever reason, they just have not worked. And when contacting the manufacturer about, you know, these issues and whatnot, we have found bugs, something about transmitters that are on a different frequency for, I guess, Europe or Asian markets that needed fixing for North America. That was one of the many types of, I don't want to say excuses, but explanations. And so those products went back and we have not been yet told if we're going to get them fixed or, or what. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's a really, really cool platform. I know Klipsch makes some Wisa products, obviously Bang & Olufsen makes some Wisa products. Um, but I would love to see more people make Wisa products or just, just generally powered wireless products in general, because I do think that that's the future. Terry Tan. Hi, Andrew and Christy. Is it true that sound bars with larger drivers offer better sound quality? For example, the Sennheiser Ambio, Samsung Q950A, Sony HTA9 with the with large driver speaker. Wait, is it true that... I'm, I'm sorry. I, is it true that sound bars with large drivers mm -hmm. or driver mm -hmm. offer better sound quality? Um... Well, I know there's always going to be people that say there's no replacement for displacement. And those are the types, not those are the types of people, but those are the people that maybe watch the magnet review and they're like, see, you get a big 15 inch woofer and it's going to sound big and you know, all that. But we're about to review a speaker that's going to come out on Sunday that has no sizable drivers of any kind. And yet it sounds like one of the biggest things I've ever heard. So it really does depend on how it's, how the drivers are being implemented and how the designers are either using DSP, which is the case of this review coming up, or are using the crossover to split up the drivers. Like for example, Tecton. Tecton um, uses, you know, five, six, seven, eight tweeters uh, on their speaker. And a lot of people are like, oh man, you know, eight tweeters, comb filtering, blah, blah, blah. Except that's not how the design of those speakers works. Not all of those are being treated as tweeters. He's just using tweeters to create the sound that maybe someone would use for a mid-range driver. Uh, and he has his own theories as to why that works for him, but it is an example of how you can create a truly big sound using smaller drivers. So sound bars also do this. They know this about smaller drivers, and but they use DSP to get around it or to take advantage of it. And so size, <laughs> size isn't everything, okay? Um, but when it comes to bass frequencies, sometimes size does matter. Or if size doesn't matter, you need an awful lot of amplification or, yeah. So you're kind of, you can get smaller with more power, smaller with more DSP, you know, things like that. There's, there is a balancing act. Ron P, guess I don't get any support unless I show gratitude first, money. I, I'm i sorry, Ron. I, I don't really know what you mean by that. Well, um, I see Ron P has a... I can see a Ron P question here. I have an old Sony turntable. Would getting a new cartridge or buying the Fluence RT85 get me better results? As with anything on a turntable, Ron, um, it's going to come down to your cartridge and your phono preamp probably most of all, because at the end of the day, a new turntable is pretty much just a, just a plinth 
that holds the thing that spins and then you know what really creates the sound is in that cartridge that then gets fed to the phono preamp that then sends the signal on to the rest of your system so if you have a turntable that spins the records at the proper speed and, and keeps that speed and the arm doesn't drift and has good balance and counterweight then the only thing you should have to upgrade potentially is the cartridge and the phono preamp so i hope maybe that was the question you were looking to have answered i think we should give away the canto passive speakers really quick before oh. um, we forget to do that <laughs> okay. so we have a question it's a trivia question mm -hmm. for you guys i'm gonna go ahead we're gonna go ahead and answer ask the question and the first person who who gives the answer in the in the comments first person to get the answer right in the comments and you have to live in north america because i am personally shipping you these speakers i i want to go out on a limb or not on a limb but i want full disclosure the canto yu passives that we are giving away are the ones that i physically used for the review okay i am sending them to you myself these are not going to be factory sealed, although I promise we didn't play hacky sack with them. They're just the one time. Just OK, just the one time. <laughs> just the one time that I used them to prop up our piano. Just the once. Minimal, <laughs> minimal scratches. There's only a couple of dings. Only a no, no. I don't think the, it's going to affect the sound or anything. <laughs> no, they are. They're, they're they are in factory good. boxes with all of the packing materials, all of the manuals, everything. They have been broken in. Um, <laughs> And I will be sending them to you. So we are yes, looking. Yes, J-Rax. We are looking for. Uh, you have to get the answer right, but you also have to live in the con in the U.S. Okay. Um, so all that said, the question, the trivia question: What is our dog's name? Go. All right. So. We're going to go ahead and continue to answer questions. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Flying 99 thank you so much for the $5. Have you ever had experience with a clip? Oh, Sean. What? Sean got the answer right. But, Sean, I think you're in, He's in Canada. Canada. So. Why, why did you? Well, I saw that he got it right. Yeah. He spoiled it. He's, well, he didn't. Well, no one else is. Oh, okay. <laughs> J can oh no it's going too fast it's, okay it's J J can Azario 77 Azario. all right so J can Azario 77 hopefully you're listening right now this is what you can need to do if you're if you are indeed in the U.S. please um, email us you should be able to find that in our about section go to the about page on YouTube you can click over to our website and contact us that way so that we can connect and get your personal info and we'll ship them off to you this week. Oh, Sean has a U.S. mailing address. Sean. Well, now I have to give you both Canto YU passives. But we only have one pair. Then I have to buy Sean another pair. All right. Done. Done. Sean and... J... Oh, shoot. I, I already J77. Forgot it. I'm scrolling up to see it. All right, guys. So, hey, hey, hey! The guy that won, not Jay Sean, the other guy, Canazaro seventy seven. Do me a favor. This will help me personally. When this is over, if you will leave a comment, like in the comment, because this whole live thing is weird. Not the live chat doesn't <laughs> don't the chats don't appear in the comment section. But if you'll just leave me a little note, it says and you know, hey, that way I'll, yeah. I can. It'll just have give me peace of mind. But anyway. you'll, you'll both get a pair. You'll both get a pair. I'll make sure of it, okay? Uh, I didn't know you had a U.S. mailing address. Uh, <laughs> so, all right. You're both getting it. Man of my word. <laughs> okay, Driving Dan 55. Thank you so much for the $5. We appreciate it. I'm looking for an ABR or preamp with good enough DAC that I don't need a stereo DAC. Or is there a way to put a good DAC into a surround sound set up okay i have to read this question here i'm looking for an ABR <laughs> or preamp with a good enough DAC that i don't need a stereo DAC, or is there a way to put a good DAC? In? okay all right if you can get by with a stereo integrated amplifier maybe you're asking if there's an avr because you think that's the only thing that has a DAC built in that's good 
if you can get by with the stereo integrated amplifier, the DACs that are inside the Audiolab M1 or the uh, 6000A or 6000A Play are very good. But believe it or not, the DAC that is inside the AXR100 from Cambridge Audio is also exceptional. And that product is, gosh, um, I think $599. And it's a great piece. It is a great piece. Um, if you're looking for an AVR with decent digital, um, I'm going to say, I'm, again, a big fan of the Onkyo. I found the Denons, the X series Denon, S Denon. If you see Denon in S series, S stands for skip. Skip right to the X series, okay? But uh, they were very good. The Onkyo is very good. If the Onkyo is very good, chances are, it's a uh, wink, uh, the Integra as well as the Pioneers are also going to be very good. But yeah, start there. I would try those. Yeah, technically you said uh, North America. Well, I'm still a man of my word, so. <laughs> so he's not very good at geography. Anyway... Arcam, Arcam, you want to know about Arcam? So do I. I also would <laughs> like to know about Anthem. I have asked for both brands to come our way. I'm like, people, the people, the people would like to hear about these brands. You know what else they want to hear about? Paradigm. Hey, Paradigm, come, come on, send us your crap. We want to review it. <laughs> Guess what I hear? Crickets, yeah. silence, the echoes of silence. And then sometimes we don't have any. Sorry, sorry, we don't have any. So that's why I, I would I would love to give you all the reviews you guys request, but alas, yeah, it just it just doesn't always happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've been a Paradigm customer for multiple multiple times in my life, and uh, I used to know a lot of people that worked. Um, at that company and unfortunately or however you want to look at it they no longer are there and I do not know the new people that are running it I know it's the old or original owners or founders of the company and they just they're wanting to do things kind of in a different way and so we keep trying we keep trying <laughs> Zach Stokes what is Katie almost got murdered today so true so true yeah the, somebody somebody mentioned about the um those tiles or the apple tiles for the track using as trackers yeah, for yeah. dogs the problem is with her if she gets out she is she's like on a race to get as far away from this house as she can until she realized that she effed up and <laughs> she's tired and needs water and then suddenly She's like, someone help me. <laughs> She's looking for anybody to like, can, are you my new parents? And she would literally go with anyone. She has yeah. no allegiance. If you have a husky, there's there's no allegiance. They're loyal so long as they can see you. <laughs> <laughs> we still love her to pieces. Though. Love her to I would pieces. Have absolutely died had yeah. we not been able to get her back. So, whew, it was a it was intense. Ah, uh, yeah. All and right. You review newly acquired vintage Pioneer. PL turntable. Mm, probably not. Wait. Who said that? Warren Sparks. Can you review your newly acquired vintage Pioneer PL turntable? We don't have... We haven't gotten it yet. Do you... Do you live in our brains? Wait. <laughs> Warren, do you work for somebody? Oh, well, we're just going to... We're okay. Keep going. <laughs> Malcolm S. <laughs> Currently, I have the Vizio V51H soundbar subwoofer. I'm planning to upgrade to the Klipsch 5's Heritage. Mm -hmm. Good thing you didn't say the Cinema 1200 because I would have had to stop you. And currently building a sealed box for uh, oh. JLW3. Would that setup be too bass heavy? I don't know. My biggest. My my biggest. Um, there's another question from Andy Summers I want to answer next. Um, would it be too much bass? The only thing that I would recommend that you do is make sure that you have some measure of control either manually on the sub that you're building. 
because by hooking a sub to the fives, you are you activate automatically. You activate their um, their low pass the, your their filtration, and it cuts the base of that speaker pretty much right off at the knees. Which for a lot of people opens up flexibility and placement because they can be a very bass heavy speaker on their own. So you are going to route all of that bass right off the rip to your subwoofer. At which point, then it's going to come down to what kind of control you have over the sub you're building. Make sense? That's all that I would I would recommend is if you're building your own subwoofer, whatever you use or plate amp you attach to it, make sure that it has the appropriate controls for things like phase, uh, level, um, uh, things like that, so that you can dial it down to where you need it to be. Because unfortunately, the app that controls the fives, that controls the twelve hundred, that controls the six hundred, it's still just not finished, and so you're limited. But the second you connect a sub to the fives, um, it cuts the base of those speakers right in half. So just letting you know. Oh, Warren Sparks about the turntable. Mm -hmm. Apparently he missed purchasing it, purchasing it by one day. So they let you know that it... <laughs> We're going to have to have some words All right. with some people. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh did, did you answer? I have not answered. I'm, I want to get back to Andrew Summers' question. Andy. Andy Summers. I'm sorry. Andy Summers. What is the best Lucasfilm THX sound system cinema that you have been to, and what movies have you heard in THX? Best movies in THX, and did you notice JBL speakers? Okay. The best... I'm assuming you're. I'm allowed to talk about professional cinemas, right? Um, one of the best THX systems that I have ever heard was not for public, um, display, like the public couldn't get there. It was in a mixing house in Los Angeles. And I don't know if it's still around anymore or not. Um, but they mix movies there. And I had the good fortune of being able to have some time in mix my first feature film there and I thought that it was absolutely fabulous and unfortunately I have never been able to watch my own movie in a way where it has lived up to that experience um I've come close um our my film screened at an Arclight theater in, in Los Angeles, one of their new ones, one of the new digital cinema ones. And that was very, very good. That was, that was um, pretty amazing. Uh, but since then, and unfortunately, the down mix in the home market was just abysmal. So I don't even use my own film as reference. Um, but theatrical cut, the sound was fantastic. And it was in that particular screening room and I know it was a THX screening room. I want to say it was using JBL speakers, um, but I'm not 100% on that now that I'm thinking about it. I've also been very impressed with M&K back in the day. M&K had THX speakers back in the day, and I used to think that those were the shit. And I still think that they could be, and I would love to get a pair of the new M&K models that are out there, and I've even inquired through Instagram with them, and I just haven't had any luck yet. But I hope that answers your question. I have. I want to help see if you can answer Mighty Q 29s question. Mm -hmm. uh, he or she, they are, they are blind. Oh, and they're wanting to set up a system that will do audio descriptive and surround sound. Do you have any insight for that? Audio descriptive and surround sound. I honestly do not know how to answer that question, and how I feel terrible. I have never once in my life ever considered having to test that. And I know that it's, I know that a lot of products or a lot of source material have that option in the, not chapters, but in the audio. What does that even mean, audio descriptive? So it's a different, um, kind of like you can activate subtitles on a movie. Mm -hmm. it it activates a different layer of information if you will in the mix 
I don't want to speak out of turn because like I said, I am aware of what you're just, I, I think I'm aware of what you're talking about, but I've never activated it. So that's something, that's food for thought. I kind of, thank you. I don't know how to answer your question. And I apologize that I don't know how to answer your question, but now I'm going to try and at least see what that's about. And if nothing else, be able to maybe incorporate it in future reviews because kind of like what Christy has done with how I look at reviews going forward, how I look at reviews, because I didn't always do this. Um, where she does, she makes it a point to really kind of rate dialogue intelligibility for, for you guys. And, and I never used to really think about things that way because, and it's not like, it's not bragging or I hope it doesn't come across as bragging, but I just, I've never been one of those people that watches something and, and, got, and goes, what? Huh? But I realize that even as I've gotten older, it is starting to creep up as, as good as I've tried to take care of my hearing. And so having her here to kind of um, bounce that off of has been really rewarding. And I think you guys have benefited from it. So hearing questions like this from, you know, our viewers, it just gives me another thing to have to think about because I want our reviews to be as well-rounded as possible. So. We'll try to, we'll try to find out more information about that. Yeah. He is drunk right now. Mm. No, I'm not. He, they could be talking to somebody else. Who knows? Oh, hold on. We, okay. We, we, I was just going to ignore that. Oh, I'm drinking Waterloo lemon lime sparkling water. Let's see. Um, oh my gosh, I really want to try to pronounce your name, Mister Olivio, but I, I would, I would ruin it, and I don't want to do that. Thank you for being a member, first of all. Um, he loves our reviews. Thank you. Mm. Do you have any plans on reviewing Dolly, 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 Dolly speakers? Jeez, I haven't been drinking either, so <laughs> I'm just bad at reading. Uh, Dolly speakers. We we, we have we did. we did we reviewed the Oberon ones, mm -hmm. which we really loved. We tried to review I think the Seven Seas, those towers that came out. The powered towers. The powered towers. We were really excited to review those. Yes. The reality is the they didn't work, and we ultimately sent them back. We did not get another pair because, truthfully, the people that distribute Dolly and other products, um, their parent company, they have a serious issue with packaging. And it's not just Dolly, it is other Lindbrook products. And I, and I hate to call them out like this, but it's just... The Dolly products are not packaged well. None of, ha, with the exception of NAD and Blue mm -hmm. Sound, and I think part of that is because it's a very small form factor we're talking about, and maybe they just do invest more in the packaging. Most of the other stuff, not good, not good. PSB tower speakers barely arrived. Um, there was massive holes in the packaging. They and had to send us replacement boxes yeah, just to get them back. Just to get them back. And when that, when that start, when that started to be a repeat situation, we just honestly were like, what we don't, we we didn't ask for the another pair of the Dolly Seven Cs and haven't requested anything si since. Um, I'm really hoping that maybe they can work out some of those packaging problems oh, because we sorry. would like to review more. But that would be why you haven't seen those on the channel lately. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Sorry, Lindbrook, for yeah. you know, outing you. And yes, we did say the same thing about the mag the the magnets those. The boxes for those, um, in my opinion, I do not think that they are robust enough that depending on how good your UPS or FedEx carrier is, ours typically is, he's pretty rough. He's a pretty gruff guy. He and, shot puts our stuff. And he shot puts our stuff. And at, at that point, I would say, yes, the magnet boxes, the mileage is definitely going to vary. Um, I want to get Sean... Uh, hey, buddy, Sean, I can't find your movie for purchase anywhere or download. There's a reason for that. And I can finally kind of talk about it, but I have to be very careful. So 
I made my first film in 2000. I started actually writing it in 2006, 2007. We shot it in 2008. It came out theatrically in 2009. And when it came out, it was the first ever film, first of all, first ever film shot entirely in 4K. It was the first ever film that was released theatrically and on iTunes at the same time. I was way ahead of the curve in wanting this film to be available to everyone on the same day across whatever platforms. And it was a bit of an outlandish idea at that time in 2009. I mean, this is like pre-YouTube, all that stuff. Um, we opened theatrically up opposite uh, a Zac Efron movie and a Beyonce movie. We got absolutely crushed, except for like two key two markets. We actually beat them. Uh, but on iTunes, we were the number one independent film uh, for three or four months running. And we were second in terms of downloads at that time behind The Dark Knight. And so I was really happy about that. But that's also when I learned a very um, interesting, uh, interesting financial conundrum about streaming rights and how streaming pays nothing. So you can have the number two film on iTunes for 90 straight days and only make a couple thousand dollars. <laughs> um, and so there started to be some infighting amongst the executive producers, not with me, but amongst themselves in terms of like, how do we make more money faster? And the thing about movies that you have to understand is movies are a marathon, not a sprint. And so I was always trying to tell people that it was going to take years to recoup the investment, right? Well, they didn't really like that answer. And so I had to step aside. And for 10 years, I do not know who was in charge of my film. I don't know who was in charge of it. All I know is some at some point during that time, after I was unceremoniously released from my film, um, that film disappeared from the face of the earth. And in early 2020, I was contacted by one of the original EPs of the film, executive producers of the movie, um, who I had not spoken to in 10 years, ever since having to walk away from my own film. And I was able to reacquire my movie. I own it. It's mine. I have it in my possession. The reason you can't get it anywhere is I have not re-released it. Because honestly, I don't know what I want to do with it. That was such a big deal and a big part of my life professionally. It did not um, ultimately go the way that I thought it was going to go because of circumstances. And it was incredibly stressful and painful to watch four years of my life disappear from the face of the earth. Um, so I'm very glad that it's back. I'm very glad that I own it. It's mine. I can do whatever I want with it. I just don't know what that's going to be yet. If I were to re-release it, I already know that it needs a re-edit because I did not have picture um, lock on my own movie. And so ultimately... Describe what that means. Well, I was able to... I was I was able to put together my edit with my editor um, and we put together a great film. We really did. And we put together a film that was what I wanted to make, a director's cut, if you will. And the film tested very well, but ultimately the people that put some of the money into the film wanted the movie to be a little bit more focused on one of the key areas of the story and a little bit less about another. And so I was forced to re-edit the movie to satiate their wants and desires. So ultimately what came out in the theaters, the 98 minute cut of the movie in theaters is not the edit or the film I wanted to make or that I did make and that we had a copy of. And unfortunately, they own they owned the film. Now, I own it again. It's mine. I can re-edit it, and I can put out the full version, which was closer to two hours. It was like just under two hours. And I think the film makes a ton more sense when it's a little bit longer. But in doing that, I would have to re-edit it. 
I would have to rescore it and remix it, remaster it. And now that Dolby Atmos is a thing, I would have to do all of that from scratch. And well, we run a channel. You see us twice a week. This is a full-time job. I honestly, I just do not know how I would accomplish that in any meaningful way without needing to step away from all of this in order to do that. And even if I created this channel or took a part of this channel to take you through that process, I anticipate the budget to do that would probably be close to a million dollars. And I don't have that kind of money right now. So unfortunately, the film's going to hang out in my office for the time being. People are asking what the name is, or do you want to give that away? Or can you say? I can say what the name is, and I will. And they want to know the premise. And I want to throw it out there. Okay. I have not. Oh, my God. Hmm. I haven't been able to publicly speak about my movie in 10 years. Um. Wow. Oh, babe. <laughs> I just realized that I can actually tell you what my movie's called. So, all right. Um, the film is called April Showers. I know that there are, I know that there are pirated copies out there. Um, some of you with like uh, bit torrents and stuff like that, you're probably going to find a really crap copy of it. That is not the movie I made. Okay. Uh, the quality of a, of a bit torrent, notwithstanding that I absolutely horrid, but that's not the film that we made. That is the film that we were ultimately kind of forced to put out. Um, but the film is called April showers. It is semi autobiographical because when I was 18, I was in Columbine High School when the mass shooting took place. I was there. I was a part of that. Um, that had a deep and profound impact on my life. And the film is a fictional retelling of what transpired in the seven to ten days afterwards because that's not something a lot of people got to see and so it stars tom arnold Ileana douglas kelly blatz daryl sabara ellen walglom um janelle parish just really really great talented young actors that a lot of them back in you know 2006 7 8 and 9 you know they were coming up things like Disney Channel and, and whatnot. Um, and I'm very, very proud of the work that we did on that film. Very proud. And I'm very proud of the director's cut that my team put together. And I'm still, I'm still proud of what came out in theaters. I'm grateful for everyone that supported that film while it was in theaters and when it was available for you know purchase and whatnot. If you are one of the people that are going to pirate the movie or find a pirated copy. I, I can't control your opinion of it. Um, that's just not the film that we made. And it's definitely not the quality that I want out there in the world. So I don't know if I'm ever going to do anything with my movie. Um, but uh, I'd like to. I'd like to. But then again, it's also now... Shoot... 12, 13 years old, maybe it's time to just let it be. I don't know. I really don't know how I feel about it. I just know that this is literally the first time that I've ever publicly been able to talk about my movie in over a decade. And it's weird. It's really weird. It's really weird. So. Oh. <laughs> it's, oh, that was, that's sad. Um. Okay, gonna try to take it back to audio. take it back to hi-fi. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, let's see. I, Terrell I, says I recently moved, and because of space, I cannot put all of my setup. Sorry, I'm reading this word for word. Okay. I recently moved, and because of space, I cannot pull put. Sorry, my I'm the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot put all my setup for my turntable. 
I have a Sony soundbar ST5000 high-res audio. Mm -hmm. It can deliver, I think he's or saying, can it deliver hi-fi audio with its analog input? I'm sorry. Oh, so he has a turntable, and he's asking if he connects it to a soundbar, the Sony specifically. Yes. Will it be good enough for hi-fi audio? And I'm going to say, give it a shot. Whether or not it's good enough for quote-unquote hi-fi, who knows? But if you like it, that's all that matters. And if you like it enough and then you become curious about other things, then you know you have a baseline. You've created a baseline for yourself, right? So figure out a way, connect it to the soundbar, listen to some records, figure out if that's for you so that if you do change, go to something else in the future, it better be better than the soundbar, right? And if it's not, then you can go to all the audio files or hi-fi comments and whatnot and be like, this is my baseline. This didn't beat it. I'm sticking with my soundbar. So. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> I'm trying to find another question. Oh my gosh. Moderating is hard, guys. <laughs> you have no idea. Uh... Oh, Lagai. Lagai. Yeah, what a me, great me name. Here. Save me. If... If on a limited budget, would Dirac Live or room treatments be more effective? That is the question, isn't it? Me personally, in my opinion, um, and the world will come for me for saying this, room treatments matter. They do. It's kind of an analog versus digital type of a conversation. And, but processing, DSP, room correction, all of these things have gotten so good. So unbelievably good that I have not had to pull out my room treatments that often, if at all, because things like Direct, things like Odyssey make that big of an, make that big of a difference and allow me the customization if I don't like what they've done to go in and kind of tailor it to my needs. And since a lot of these platform software is built into the products you're buying, I say use it before deciding to spend more money. Wishbone has a really good question, I think, kind of going back to the whole movie mm -hmm. situation. Um, how often in the industry do we really get to see the creator's full vision? Not very. <laughs> Unless your name is Spielberg, uh, I would say Fincher, but not even then. Um, Spielberg, Scorsese, um, you'd be amazed. You would be amazed. We cut, no joke, we cut the first full cut of our movie in probably two weeks. And then we spent four months, five months, trying to find an edit of the film that appeased all of the people that legally had a say in what we made. Um, and that was soul crushing absolutely soul crushing and i want to give mad props to my editor and his team mark salt i don't think you're watching um he hung in there with me every single day trying to and and i i was beside myself during that process because i didn't know that that was part of this industry and he was a bit more of a veteran and he held my hand comforted me fed me cigarettes by the carton because I used to smoke back then and talked me down off so many ledges and his his editing assistant who is now a full-fledged editor in his own right Daniel those two got me through my own movie and I could not have asked for a better team all the way around from producers to colorists to visual effects people to the actors. I mean, it is it is a communal art in the purest sense, but very, very rarely if you go to see something, are you seeing 100 percent what the creator, the writer and you can have this conversation with writers you know, the guy that writes the script and slaves over it, and it's his story. And it's just like he, he, he or she poured their heart and soul into the written word. And then they get to set 
and they hand it off to a director or producer and it, it turns out to be a Ninja Turtles movie all of a sudden, you know? Um, and that's just the way it works. I happen to be the writer and the director of my own project as well as one of the producers. I negotiated that deal in order to retain some measure of control. But even with retaining some measure of control, um, yeah, very rarely, very rarely. Daryl McDowell, thank you so much for contributing. I, I hope you're still around. If you are, he would like an opinion. Sorry, that's our dog. <laughs> uh, of the, uh, I'm, assu I'm assuming he means the K the Kef. It mm -hmm. says KLF. Is there a such thing as a KLF? KLH. Maybe or a he KLH. Jeez. He now what? Now what to do? So I don't know if we can. <laughs> I don't know if we can answer this question. What's the K question? It says KLF 30s and outlaw amps. What's your opinion? Thanks. I don't have one. I feel like we should give him a refund. <laughs> uh, oh, goodness. Did we answer Matthew Langley's question, the cool. Sony A9, or should I go with something like the Onkyo RZ50 and Heco Auroras and scale up in the future? Well, I, I asked what his goal was, but I don't know if he replied. Yeah, I mean, it really does come down to what what is your goal. Um, obviously, if you go with the RZ50 in a Heco Aurora system, you have the ability to scale. You have the ability to adjust, to tinker, to play, and to expand as technology in your heart's content or budget allows, right? So if you know that you're going to want that flexibility in the future, as good as I believe the A9 to be, you should, you should get a more traditional home theater setup. But if you have come off of a traditional home theater setup or are looking for a soundbar replacement and you're just like, I'm, I'm ready to get off the roller coaster. I want something that's simple, impactful, enveloping, and easy. A9's for you. Alex Pendragon. Mm -hmm. That's a great name. On a severe budget, are ELAC B 5.2s that much better than the Sony SCSC 5s? And huh, you may see, there she is. Little turd. There's the runaway. I can get the ELACs with five monthly payments on Amazon, but the Sonys are cheaper. Senior rocker on a fixed income. <laughs> Look at that little All right. dork. I do I believe that the Elax do I believe Elax are better than the Sony speaker? Yes. Go ahead and lie down. Don't hit the microphone. Lie down. You're not going to get let outside. Not now. Not after today. All right. Do I believe that uh, the Elax are better than the Sony? I do. I do. But I don't believe that you should ever go into debt for hi-fi or home theater full stop as good as anything can be if something is going to put you out or put you in a tight financial situation it's never going to be worth it i really don't believe that it is so can you build a great home theater around the sony's sorry our dog can you build a great home theater around the sony's yes absolutely you can you can are the ELAX better constructed, going to have a slightly better sound, or maybe even a great, greatly better sound? Yes, they likely will. But don't go into debt for it, okay? That's probably not a smart move. If anything, if you have something currently, keep enjoying that until you can do it in one fell swoop and it's not going to tax you too much. That's just my advice. Plus, the ELAX may take a more specific kind of amplifier which right. could increase your cost right um so that's something to consider honestly the canto why you sick or sorry the new the canto passives that we reviewed recently were really really good i don't know what your total overall budget is um but i would look at those unless is he talking about a tower i don't know no the s the s s c s fives are the that... three-way bookshelves that we just referenced in yeah. the canto passive okay. okay so i would probably i would look at the passives because those are affordable you can get like the cambridge axr 100 or even maybe the axa 35 which is even less expensive again i don't know what your overall budget is or if that's going to work out to be more than the other things you're considering but anyway things to think about yeah 
Der David Lishan, Lishan, yes, when you do Google my name, you will find the actor in Dirty Harry as well as Star Trek Deep Space Nine, same guy. We're both named Andrew Robinson. Uh, Gareth Newbold, I have a Sony 1080 AVR and it sounds incredible. Is there any news on updated Sony receivers at this price point? There's no news about updated Sony receivers that I have heard, period. I've heard rumors, but in speaking with Sony and in talking with them, even surrounding our time after the you know A9 review and, and getting certain things back to them, there's no news that they have been able to share with us about AVRs. Let's do this. Let's go another 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, Vladik asks, best 85-inch TV for under $2,500. I only watch movies and sports. Well. I know you have thoughts on this. Yes, I do. I mean, the TV that I mentioned before, the Sony mm -hmm. behind Andrew, which is the X95J, I'm pretty sure that's going to run me more than $2,500. Mm -hmm. I don't. What, do you know how much the Vizio P6, or sorry, P series Quantum X is in 85? It's around there. I would look at that. It's around there. But I don't know if you can find it. That's going to be the hard thing. Yeah. They may have like done some sort of running change and re-released it under a different name. But the P series Quantum X, if you can find one in an 85 inch from Vizio, is a fantastic television. Yeah. I just don't know if that's going to meet your budget. But, but check it out. And then, I mean, on a budget, there's, I know Samsung's Crystal series gets up to that size and definitely comes in under that budget, but I don't have any hands-on uh, experience with those particular models. But if you are trying to get bigger diagonal size on a lower, at a lower cost, the Samsung Crystal series might be worth a look. Declan Cooley, any preview of the Linton review? I yeah, can tell you one thing. It's, it's right, it's right there. <laughs> they should have sent them sooner. Yeah. That's all we're going to say. Yeah. Uh, Christopher Cord uh, Cordova. Hey, guys, quick question. Loudness setting on a receiver. Is it suggested to have it active? Have it active if you're listening at lower volumes. I think once you turn it up to a certain degree, it's really not going to have that big of an impact. But if you are trying to listen at lower volumes and still get a bit of a impact, if you will, then activate it. But it's one of the easiest things to toggle on and off. So decide for yourself. Ibrahim Gran. Hi from Norway. Hello. Any tips for a matching power amp for a Luxman CL1000? No idea what that is. We, we don't know her. <laughs> <laughs> With Luxman, Luxman, truthfully, they won't send us anything because they want to dictate who we can link to. Yeah. That's the truth. Uh, Samsung QN90A for 3300, Matthew says, is good. Okay. So maybe check that out. Yeah. Love it when you guys come to the rescue and save me because I don't know everything. <laughs> Thanks uh, for joining us, joining us, Douglas. Yes. Uh, why did Harmon Carden stop making receivers? Why did Harmon Carden stop making receivers? Um... That whole brand really has kind of gone in and out of fashion, haven't they, for a lot, geez, maybe the last 20 years. Uh, Harman, Harman is a very fascinating company, and I know and I have friends that are over there and work there. Um, I Harman reminds me a lot in some degree, and I don't, I don't mean this is just my opinion. This is my perspective, okay? If there are people in our chat or that watch this video later that work for Harmon or who know me, feel free to politely set the record straight. This is just from my perspective. I think that Harmon, in a lot of ways, kind of reminds me of the way Apple either used to run under Steve Jobs or still currently runs in that there's a lot of really great ideas and kind of first one to the trough, best idea wins sort of mentality. And certain brands get more of the lion's share of the larger pot in terms of development and whatnot. And things that become popular, do well, they continue to be fed. Whereas other brands 
kind of fall by the wayside. And I just think that Harmon Carden, for some reason, much like Infinity used to be the, the, the bee's knees, have all kind of fallen by the wayside in favor of new, not new brands, but re-emerging brands for Harman like Revel or JBL Synthesis. They seem to be pumping a lot of energy into JBL Synthesis. And now that Samsung owns Harman, I think Harman is going to be a lot of R&D for products that are probably going to be badged as Samsung. That's just me. That That is my opinion. I do not have any insider knowledge. That is just kind of in taking a bird's eye view of the brand for as long as I have. That's just kind of what I've seen. Uh, we need to answer this question from J-Rax. Mm -hmm. Would like to know the best passive speakers under 300. I've been told Emotiva B1. Okay. Lots. Phono amp for 150 separate or combination is fine i just don't want to bottleneck my turntable system i'm assuming tt is abbreviated yeah turntable look the emotiva speakers are actually really good they're they're really solid products you say what you will about how they look i happen to think they are ugly um the reason we don't talk about emotiva speakers is they are currently not new and I was around that brand when they were being developed. And so I had insider knowledge of those products while they were being developed. And I was a part of their development. I'm not impartial when it comes to them. It has been very, very, it's been a long time since I've had anything to do with that company, but their speakers are still kind of the same. So I, I don't talk about them. That said, I do know that they are typically very good and they perform very well. So you can take that with a grain of salt, knowing that I had something to do with them, but I am telling you objectively or best as I can that they are good. Um, best phono preamp, I don't know if Emotiva still makes their standalone phono preamp, but it is the same phono preamp, if they do, it is the same phono preamp that was inside their stereo reference two-channel uh, preamp, their dual, fully balanced dual reference preamp. They put the phono preamp section in its own box. If they still sell that, it is very good. Um, just today, I was listening to uh, the standalone phono preamp U-Turn. Uh, U-Turn offers a standalone phono preamp. I was listening to that and I was actually quite impressed. I had it with a project turntable, project phono box. Of, there are a myriad of those. Those are great. So start there, start there. But if you've heard good things about the Emotiva speakers at the low price, I think you're probably going to be okay. It's me, AB. Thoughts on Nakamichi soundbars? We don't know. I've asked for them mm -mm. a few times and they always say they don't have anything to send us. So yeah. I I know a lot of people think they're the best, but couldn't tell you. Um, Francisco Silva, this is very, very generous of you. Thank you so much. Um, and hello in Chile. Uh, <laughs> do you know if Yamo has plans for new speaker models? Should I change my D590 for monitor audio gold 300s? Yamo is coming out with new speakers. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. But they are going to come out with some new speakers. I have no idea what the makeup is. I have no idea what line is getting updated or if it's going to be a whole new line. I know nothing more than Yamo is going to have new speakers, but it may be well into next year. That's all I know. Um, should I change my D9, D590 for monitor audio gold 300? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I can't answer that for you, unfortunately. But Yamo is coming out with new speakers. All right, let's do just a couple more. Um, aha, Matthew Langley. I know you guys were looking at the QN800A. I'm considering the QN900A. and curious if you noticed any benefit from 8K upscaling. I am going to refrain from talking about the Samsung, and I'm just going to try and address 8K upscaling. 
have I noticed a difference with 8K upscaling? Keep in mind, we have had uh, LG 8K TVs and now we've had Samsung 8K TVs. I would still have my LG 8K TV on the wall right over here behind me because that TV was freaking awesome. The reason I don't have it anymore is I broke it. I fat fingered it and I cracked the screen. I did that. Uh, that was a very expensive mistake on my part. Um, I happen to think that 8K TVs are the best 4K TVs money can buy, if that makes sense. But that is how I view them. I think 8K scaling does make a difference. I think films that are shot in 4K with, oh, my phone, sorry. Amateur. Amateur hour. Bush League. Um, I, I think that films that are really well shot in 4K, mastered properly, and that are released uh, either streaming or on disc in 4K look absolutely magnificent in 8K. Um, I will admit, if you're watching 720p, 1080p material, depending on the strength of the processor in the television, upscaling can get a little dicey. Uh, Low-res streaming gets absolutely horrid. Um, but if you are, if you're good with feeding an 8k display, the best of the best of the best with honors, they're really special. They really are. Uh, you don't need, you don't need 8k content to make 8k look good, to make an 8k TV look good. Um, okay. I'm trying to scroll back up to see if I missed anything. Uh, oh goodness. I'm ret uh, Ron Sturman, if you're still around. Hello, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. I'm returning to Hi-Fi after 35 years with the Klipsch RP8000F and Denon AVR X2700H. Hmm. Be a good combination. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Probably. I don't see why it wouldn't be. Yeah, I don't... They really I really liked the... That, that was the X2700H we just had in house right yeah i think so yeah that was that was solid yeah it was, it was a good. solid product surprised the heck out of me yeah was like, like i said denon like denon s series s stands for skip <gasps> denon x series x marks the spot that's oh I, wow it's all Did you need you to just know come up with that just now right off the top of my head you know what you are more than just a pretty face <laughs> don't let anybody tell you differently <laughs> <laughs> all right Oh, gosh. Oh, my gosh. You guys are great. You guys have been awesome. Thank you so much for making this show uh, so enjoyable to this evening. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. We, we should probably wrap it up. Yeah. We'll take one more question. How about that? One more. One more. Oh, goodness. Which one? Who has a good one? John Sackett. Guess what? It's you. Okay. Reflecting or direct Atmos speaker placement? Question <laughs> mark. All right. Well, uh, how do I answer this? I have in my personal theaters, I have never used direct Atmos channels. I have only used reflecting speakers for Atmos. I happen to think reflecting speakers can work and even sound pretty good. I know there are people out there that will say otherwise or will convince you or try to convince you otherwise. I think it really depends on your ceiling height. If you have the ceiling height between, say, 8 and 14 feet and you don't want to put in ceiling or hang bookshelves above your head, try the reflecting stuff. It's actually pretty effective. Um, I have been in some theaters or heard demos where there have been dedicated channels. And the one thing... Excuse me. The one thing I will say about um, channels like, you know, actual dedicated speakers overhead that I don't like is I find them to be a little more directional for my taste. So I often end up asking to have them turned down so they become a little bit more kind of vague or amorphous because I just like that, that hint of ambience. I don't necessarily like it when when surround speakers become ultra ultra directional. And to me, the mark of a good surround system is one that envelops you in a seamless 360 degree dome 
And for me, I think that reflecting speakers actually do that a little bit better than, you know, point source type, you know, speakers that are, you know, dedicated channels. So that's what I'd say to that. All right. That's it. So. So we have, we've already announced the winner of the Canto Pass, Canto Pass. Yes. Two winners. Cause I goofed and spoke too soon and you both will be getting Canto YU passives. So. So if you, you, you people that won, you already, the two of you that yeah. won, you already know who you are. The people asking if you won, you did not. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, you did not win, but we still love you. And, and, and that means you're the, the real winner. With the love in your heart. <laughs> hey, uh, the the BKG, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it might take a crowdfund. If I want to uh, re-edit the movie and re-release it, it might. Because one of the things that I would be very wary of is accepting anyone else's money but my own uh, in doing anything with that movie in order to put it out so that I was beholden to no one. Because uh, that... We know how that ends. <laughs> um, John uh, McCar Cargar, uh, thank you very much. And we do this once a month. Uh, it's never the same day every month, but it's usually Thursdays. And we do try and do these once a month. And you were, we're just so great, grateful that you were able to catch this one. So, all right, guys, we have to go. It is getting dark and the dog will require a walk. And we need food. And we need food. So thank you so, so very much, guys, for tuning in, for bearing with us. Uh, I think the picture looked better this time. I think the picture looked better. I think I definitely for my end, mm -hmm. I, I'm watching on my iPad yeah. right now, so it looks way better. Good. Um, your skin looks fantastic, by the oh. way. And, so, and the deep V in the shirt is <laughs> like so sexy. Um, <laughs> there are complaints about the sound. You know, I don't think people love the the left and right speaker uh, split All situation. Right. But I, I honestly, I don't know what to do about it. Well, I have to probably get a different sound device. Right now we're using a Scarlett and um, I did buy it for our first ever live stream, what, two months ago. So I'm not, I'm, I'm a noob with this stuff. Uh, but I did upgrade to an Elgato stream deck for the video. So I'm very, very pleased with that snap review. If you're into streaming, I have no problems with the Elgato for visuals. So maybe for next month, I will do my damnedest to figure out the audio and get this totally dialed in and on point for you guys. Yeah, right. Says so I'll take a, I'll take a consolation prize, maybe a couch cushion. That's funny. <laughs> All right. All right, anyway, guys. Hey, guys. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Yes. We really do appreciate it. And to everyone who um, did the super chats. If I didn't call you out by name or get to your question, I'm so, so sorry. This this chat thing moves at a speed that I can hardly keep up with. We'll, we'll try to work on that, but thank you again. To everyone else that I didn't get to your question, I'm also sorry. Um, we will try to always continue to do better. Yes. But thank you. Thank, thank you, you, thank so you. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. And that's all. That's all. Bye, guys.